Well, thank you so much for being a guest here today and joining us on the speaker series. I actually remember quite, quite clearly, I think, when I had the idea to invite you to the speaker series. Now, I have to admit that in the midst of that group conversation, I kind of tuned out a little bit because I started thinking about how great of a topic this would be for the speaker series. And so I have a feeling my memory might be a little bit distorted. So I probably want to start personally for myself, just rehashing what I think happened and have you sort of add to that. Okay, all right, okay, sure, great. And so at uh, one of our program area meetings, uh, I think we were discussing having a community group come in and talk about suicide, give a workshop to our students, partly because student demand, partly because I think it's very, very important. Um, and somewhere in that conversation, as we talked about approving them and arranging the dates, uh, you came out and said something critical about what we know about suicide. And it sort of blew me away and floored me because I also have a small private practice and I'm doing some of these things that I consider standard normative practice. And I think, or at least I thought, that I was doing a good job in accurately assessing my client's suicidal risk. And you made some comments to the contrary. And so I want to turn over to you in terms of how you remember that, that conversation. And Yeah, that's funny that you mentioned that. I didn't realize that you had that sort of insight when we were having that conversation. It was, it was interesting when I was listening to you talk about the, like introducing the Heterodox Academy, sort of thinking about it, or the Heterodox sort of speaker series, I'm sorry. I was thinking about it and I was like, I'm actually a rather agreeable person. And so this is just one of those things that like unintentionally sort of this, like knowledge fell to me mm -hmm. and that I've sort of, and then I was like, oh, that's interesting. And I sort of investigated further and I was like, oh yeah, this seems pretty clear cut. And so I think that that was, and I, I remember that particular conversation because I felt, I, I feel like I felt a little anxious to even like bring it up because it was like a little bit of pushback, you know, and sort of that, and I, but I sort of did feel like this is one of those things that is worth talking about because it is, you know, I mean, it's high stakes, it's people's lives, uh, literally. So yeah, the conversation was about bringing somebody in to teach about risk assessment or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I remember sort of sitting thinking like, all right, I should probably. And so first of all, for the students, and I felt the exact same way, which is that the idea of getting more training on suicide and what to do when you have clients who are suicidal is completely makes sense. It's totally normative. And like, in fact, if you didn't want that, that might be a little bit concerning. So I think that this isn't a comment at all about that sort of thing. But that normally what we do when we teach students about suicide, at least in my experience, is it's, okay, what are the, like, what's the data that you need to get from clients in order to assess their risk of suicide? you know, sort of with the most extreme suicide death, but even a suicide attempt or whatever. You need to collect this information and then make some sort of a decision based on this information and then taking that information and saying like, okay, what is their risk status? Then what am I going to do about it? That's sort of, I don't know, was that more or less how you were taught, Rob? Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. And so, but then the more I learned that, the more relatively recently I learned about it and learned that, well, our ability to predict suicide is so bad that it is completely useless in a clinical context. So like, is this weird, is this weird thing where we're in this field and sort of, and the surrounding fields, which I, you know, generally do think, like I, I do believe that people are very sort of empirically and theoretically based in sort of good ways and being mindful of like, what are the sort of the data and that sort of thing. And it sort of like has hit me over, you know, like it's like this huge gaslighting. It's like the, in this context where the evidence is really clear and the logic is really clear, but we continue to practice in this other way and train our students in this other way. And which ends up getting in the way of our students being helpful, even more important, gets in the way of helping our clients who are suicidal. Yeah. And so, I remember when you made comments like that, you know, my reaction was quite defensive in my mind. I didn't say it out loud, and, and, uh, but my reaction was quite defensive. And I think that's the type of speaker I'm really interested in, in inviting to our series. If there's a speaker who has ideas, which I say, I disagree with that person, that person's wrong, or it causes a visceral reaction in me, 
it does sort of interest me and well, I need to like hear like what's this reaction about? So, and I think that that, so that's another interest. So like I gave a talk at the Society of Psychotherapy Research so this past summer when it was in Denver, yes. something like that. Yep. And so, so I guess about nine months ago. And so the majority of my talk was not on this, but I did use some of this to sort of like set it up. And so like after the talk and after all the talks were done, I was like, yeah, you know, just hanging out and people were talking and other psychologists were talking. And two, I heard two psychologists talking and they were saying like, and one of them was saying something about risk because like, well, you know, you, you have to do risk assessment. Like what else would you do? And I was, yeah, of course you do. And it hit me in that moment that having like spending 45 seconds pushing against this is not enough because it's so ingrained in what we're taught and what we believe and what we do that like the conversation, it takes more than that to sort of rearrange our schemas or a way of thinking about things because it is such a shift. Okay, great. Well, I want to just maybe take a step back here, but that does clarify that yes, my memory was accurate because I did sort of tune it out because I was having some reactions thinking, oh my gosh, am I doing it all wrong? I thought this was evidence-based. What about my clients I'm seeing on Friday? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's where my mind did go. But maybe let's step back a little bit and I'm interested in just hearing a little bit about what got, first got you interested in the area of crisis intervention or suicide as a research topic? Well, I'm, so, uh, well let, so let me just, because I will go, I'll go way sideways and like mm. this, to stay on the, this part of it, because there was sort of a, there was a particular sort of time when this stuff sort of like first entered my worldview. Because I was at the Canadian Association for Suicide Prevention, it was pre-pandemic, so let's say five years ago, it was when it was in uh, Edmonton, I think. And they had, there were a couple of talks, but there was one where they had this debate, I think it was at lunchtime, and a psychiatrist and a psychologist debating the, the value of, or like the question was something like, uh, should we be doing risk assessment? Something like that. And the psychiatrist was saying no, the psychologist was saying yes. And it was one of those neat, you know, I love debates. And when they do this thing where like everybody who thinks that we should be doing it, raise your hand. Everybody thinks that we shouldn't be doing it, raise your hand. And then they do the same thing at the end, you know, where it's like, and so in that conversation, just those two going back and forth debating, it was like, that was the first thing that sort of like opened my eyes to this. And I went from, and I don't remember exactly, but I went from like my, I, I changed how I raised my hand in that over the course of that debate. Mm. And, but I didn't really sink in there. Like it didn't fully sink in until I, you know, heard more, read more, thought more, talked more that like, oh, this is really problematic. Like we should like that I, and to where now I'm saying we absolutely should not period, full stop, done. Don't do it. It's a problem. Don't do it. But wow. in that conversation, listening to that, Mm -hmm. That's when it first entered. I, was, I never even thought of it before because it's just what I was taught. And then mm -hmm. there's another presentation uh, at that same conference, and then it sort of snowballed from there. Mm -hmm. Dude, now I'm feeling a bit uncomfortable. Don't do it. Mm -hmm. I think I can't imagine uh, my counseling and not doing it. And uh, in my practice, I work a lot with rehabilitation clients who do have suicide as something that commonly comes about. And you're saying don't do it. And in particular, and I'll sort of say this: this is a this is kind of the take home, which is the real thing that we cannot do is we cannot predict risk. Or I'm sorry, we can't predict suicide well enough to make it at all clinically valuable. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean don't talk about suicide. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you know if a client is saying I'm going to go home and I'm going to what that you don't intervene in some way. But we cannot, in a clinically useful way, predict clients' probability of attempting or dying by suicide. We just can't. Mm. We just can't. It is clini clinically useless. Yes. And uh, that gets shocking to me when you say that. Shocking. Um, I'm just going to take a moment just to take it in here in that sense of that. I'm losing confidence in my ability now to predict suicide with my clients. Good. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Everybody should lose confidence. And, and, and apparently that's evidence-based. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you said it a few times though, we can't predict suicide or which your class is likely to commit suicide in terms of risk assessment really well. Um, how well can we predict it then? Right. That's a good question. So, so this is, the problem is really, it's a low incidence problem, which is a good problem, by the way, when it comes to suicide. <laughs> um, 
So there was, there's been a bunch of studies, but there was a study in uh, 2012 by, it was a uh, Madsen 2012, it was a sample of, it was like 125,000 uh, psychiatric patients. And so what they did was they looked at the folks who were low risk and the folks who were high risk, okay? So for the folks who are low risk, their probability of dying by suicide um, or, let's see, say this right. The, if you said, if they were low risk, the probability of them dying by suicide in the next day is about one in 45,000, okay? If they were high risk, now this is another thing to think about, well, I can talk back. If they were in high risk, the probability of dying by suicide in the next day was about one in 20,000, okay? So just extrapolating from that. So if you said, so high risk, these are the high group. So if you said, okay, this person's high risk. And so as a clinician, generally speaking, what you are interested in is the probability that they're going to attempt or die by suicide in the next 24, 48, maybe 72 hours. Mm -hmm. So a limitation of a lot of the work, which still doesn't support doing um, prediction, is that either they're looking at like suicide ever, like well then you'll probably have been suicide in however long the study is, or within the next year. But as a clinician, if I'm working with a client who's suicidal, I'm not worried about the next, you know, I'm gonna worry about eight months from now. I'm worried about what's gonna happen in the next day or two. So really when we're thinking about these probabilities, that's what, that's what we have to see, our accuracy in predicting that, not the next year, it's eight, right. six months from now. That's not, that's not what we're worried about. Right. So even if you said, yeah, this person's high risk, so they're likely to commit, so it's one in 20,000, which is terrible. So if you had some sort of an intervention, hospitalization or whatever it is, with every, with every client who's in that high risk category, you're going to be right, or there that, that person would have uh, died by suicide one time in twenty thousand. Mm -hmm. So we're wrong nineteen thousand nine hundred ninety nine times. Right, and so like we could say like okay, well that's that's particular study and that particular. So maybe we have some more information, some other information involved. So even if you just chop it in half to be extremely conservative, that's still one in ten thousand times that you're correct. Mm -hmm. So that's that. So that's the problem. So also in that same study, they found were of the of all of the people who did die by suicide, of those 125,000 people, the people that did eventually die by suicide, uh, I think it was within a year, that nine, oh, well, 90 percent of those people who died by suicide were in the low risk category. Okay, very surprising. Yeah, and 10% of the people who died by suicide were in the high risk category. So obviously this is be, you know, partially, you know, a big part is because so few people are in the high risk category. But so you can think about that, that your that 90% of the people, at least from this sample, who died by suicide were in the low, low risk category. So um, uh, large, who's like, he's one of the, I uh, what's it, I don't know his name, he's one of the, uh, bigger researchers in this area than a lot of meta-analysis. So he did a meta-analysis of uh, a couple hundred thousand people or whatever it was in 2014. And it was a case control study or of case control studies. So it was just a meta-analysis of that. And so he, he found that in that study, it was a 50-50. So of the people in the high risk, of the people who died by suicide, 50% of them were in the high risk category and 50% of them were in the low risk category. So maybe the 9 to 10, that might be a little extreme, but so, but it still gets at the same idea, which is that whether it's half, you know, it's 50% to 90% of the people who do die by suicide, when they are assessed, they're in the low risk category. So that gets at how much these, you know, how much does this matter? And so there's work on this. And so that suicide intent, that suicide desire, that, that's a, it's a very fickle thing. 
So it changes dramatically. It's a very dynamic thing that changes a lot over time. So people sort of, you know, we bounce around in terms of where we are in those categorizations. Mm. Yeah, I'm stopping up on the on what you're saying here is that, in the, in at least in that one study, which seems to be a very large scale study, it was the low risk people who were more likely to. No, no. Of the people who died by suicide, yeah. the majority were in the low risk. risk. Low risk. Yes. And I'm extrapolating that to my own practice and thinking, okay, well, hmm, what do I think about that? Because I would assess a lot of my clients in the low risk category. Mm-hmm. Now, I look at my next question, and I'm almost afraid to ask it, but I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Um, okay, but isn't weak prediction better than no prediction at all? Is there any kind of harm or damage we're doing if we're, we're predicting it better than 0%? Yeah. Apparently not much. I didn't know it was that bad, but is it is it okay? Is weak prediction better than nothing? Right. So let's do the sort of there are a couple different places to go with this. So one is the hospitalization side, and the other are the other sort of unintended consequences. Let's talk about the other unintended consequences, if you don't mind, rather than the hospitalization side of it. Okay. So I think this is the part that I find very interesting. This is the part that sort of fits more with my work, which is what to do in the world. But so as a clinician, if I give a suicide risk assessment, right, I have this form, some sort of suicide risk assessment. When that happens, when, when that happens, what sort of naturally happens is, so me as therapist, I go from a therapist who's being, who's really focusing on you client being there with you and really attending to what are the things that matter to you and how can I work within your worldview and all that sort of stuff. And I change and I instead I start to focus on this assessment and I start to focus on me. And so I, so what my my effect like the my um uh my superhero power that I have as the therapist I just sort of turn that off or mostly turn it off. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So also what we see with this sort of, with the assessment framework, I as therapist often think, oh, I should be able to predict. Now, maybe some people do think they are able to, even though that would be wrong. They do think that, but most don't. So what ends up happening is we start to do this thing like, okay, so I need to assess them for risk. And I should be able to use this information to predict uh, or have a good guess and then decide what to do, but I don't feel like I do actually know what to do. And so, um, but I still need to collect this information and then, you know, I'm worried that if I don't uh, do something, then uh, I'm going to have to, you know, I'll get in trouble because what they do actually attempt suicide. And then, okay, but if they do say, yeah, if they are high risk, I do have to hospitalize them. Like I got to get home and get my kid by five, it's three o'clock now. Like what's going to happen? And so what happens is it creates all this distress around this experience. So like I'll give you so as an anecdote. So when I was on internship, the the site I had, we collected data the using the outcome questionnaire 45, just basically assesses like how clients are doing. And we did that after before every session. But before the first session, clients would take that like at home or whatever. We would get those data um, before we saw our first client. And one of the items on there, which is item eight, asked about their suicidality. So what would happen among us interns, you know, I would say to one of my fellow interns, like, you know, hey, Deborah, what do you got going on after lunch? Oh, I have an intake. Oh, that's great. Uh, and she would say, oh, it's fine. So like, we got this shorthand where we used to say item eight, which was the suicide item, because when you got that, when you saw you had an intake, if the suicide item was a zero or a one, you were thinking, oh great, you want to take great. Let's see what this guy. But if it was a, uh, you know, I don't know what this, you know, a three or four or five, whatever it was, that's sort of upper end of the scale. Then it's like, oh no, like what am I getting into? I have to ask this question, or I have to like, you know, my my evening might be ruined. <clears throat> and so like, the model that we have, it's not just that our prediction is terrible and mm. not effective it creates in us, like it takes us away from being good therapists and it creates an anxiety in us oftentimes that further moves us away from being good therapists. Mm -hmm. So I have this client who's, theoretically, if I'm working with a suicidal client, who's sitting across from me, who's in extreme pain. And what I'm doing is I'm turning off the tap 
for the thing that I'm really good at for helping them work through that pain. So this sort of framework, this model that we commonly sort of teach and apply, it, it, it really impedes our ability to help those that we're working with. Okay. So if I hear you correctly then, in addition to being really off in terms of how well we can predict it, in a sense, we lose our attunement with the client and we shift off our empathy, our paraphrase, our nonverbals and kind of shift back into, into our heads. It says information gathering mode, you know, having that checklist in our head, because that's what I do in my head. You know, plan, you know, risk. I kind of go through all those things in my head. And what I hear you saying is, is that actually takes away from what the client needs. Exactly. So, you know, you'll see this in sort of the suicide work a lot. Like people typically aren't suicidal because they want to die. They're suicidal because they want the pain to stop. Right. So as therapists, we're actually pretty good at, you know, helping clients understand their experience, sort of move you know through that sort of emotional experience whatever it is but we're pretty good at helping people move through that sort of um, short-term pain uh i mean it might come back or whatever but like we don't do that so if you came to if, if i had a client who came to you who's in extreme psychological distress and i was thinking like okay this person's in extreme psychological distress I'm going to, over the next hour, my goal is to help them to work through some of that distress. That's what we should be moving. That, that's what we should be doing. And by, and you know, and all that comes along with it, right, which is trying to conceptualize what's going on with them, working with them to help them understand what's going on with them so that they can work through that. And by reducing that pain, their likelihood of attempting suicide is going to go way down because that is why they are suicidal. Okay. okay, so I hear what you're saying there. Now, it gets me curious then, is there a process research or crisis intervention or crisis line research that looks at this at the more micro level or process level? Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of what we do. That, that's a lot of what I'm doing or like or with my students and other colleagues and stuff. And, you know, but there's, you know, good work from crisis stuff, you know, that does have models for helping clients to work through this. But I would... So there are specific models, and I, I'll get into that in a minute, but that, you know, in a lot of ways, what I argue for is <laughs> therapists sort of issuing, and I, I can talk about this as well, which is like, I'm talking idealistically, like in a perfect world that we don't live in, but in a perfect world, I would, you know, I am arguing for issuing the current model of how we do things and just doing what you already do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're, um, uh, if you're a psychodynamic psychotherapist, if you're you know, a cognitive behavioral therapist, uh, if you're a person-centered, if you're emotion-focused, like don't abandon that. Like it's such a weird thing that you know we work for so long to sort of develop these frameworks and models and ways of conceptualizing our clients, and we you know work with our clients and we learn how to do specific interventions. Uh, you know, at first you try and you're no good, and then you get better at it, you get you learn, you have this develop this repertoire for really helping the diversity of clients in ways where you can be pretty effective, but we just sort of like throw it in the garbage when it comes to our suicidal clients. Like it's this weird thing. It's like all of a sudden we go from being like electrician to farmer. So why would we do that? Like keep, keep why, why do we stop doing what it is that we're so good at doing? So I think broadly speaking, that's, that's what I think we should be doing. We should be doing more of what we're really good at. Right. So not, Slipping into the, the checklist mode again, it's like, okay, well, let's stop what we're doing. I need to assess your suicide risk now. Is this something that needs to be hospitalized? Can you safety plan? And just sort of keep going on with the session as we normally would, is what you're suggesting. Right, yeah, exactly. And so like one specific example of this, so like suicide disclosure. So this is something that we do within the context of suicide risk assessment, because we ask questions about suicide. But we do it to collect information to either put in some sort of an algorithm, whether it's on paper in our head or in our feelings or whatever, to make a decision, um, rather than facilitating their disclosure in order to help them understand and work through. And that when the work done with suicidal clients or clients who have been suicidal is they say that, you know, that's what they want out of disclosure from a therapist is they want emotional support. They would, of course, well, of course you would. 
you know, and so when you think about suicide disclosure, it has lots of disclosure. There's a stigma, potentially. I mean, it varies person to person, culture to culture, context to context. But a lot of times, you know, clients haven't talked to anyone about their desire to die by suicide. Similarly, as all of us haven't talked to anyone about lots of things. That's one of the things that happens oftentimes in therapy is there's a context where people can actually talk about this. And one thing about therapy that's therapeutic is you're going to tell me something that you haven't told anybody else because you're anxious about it or there's a, you haven't know, experienced it as stigmatizing or whatever. And then I'm going to respond in a way that is non judgmental. And just that simple response of, you know, sort of like, I'm still going to accept you. I'm not going to reject you. I'm not going to alienate you. That in itself is therapeutic. And so the same thing applies to suicide, where just with working with a client and having them disclose that and talk about that, you know, they're probably not doing it oftentimes. You know, they don't have a space to do that outside of the therapy room. So that in itself is very therapeutic. So I think that you just, you know, that shift, but if you think about it, if you're doing it for an assessment, it's very different sort of yeah. experientially as a therapist than if I'm doing it in a therapeutic right. way. So what you're saying is, if you're gathering information for an ulterior purpose, which is a risk assessment, it's very different than if you're gathering it as part of the dialogue, as part of the client clarifying, as part of providing the client support. And I think a lot of what you're saying is a lot of counselors, psychologists, well, very quickly slip into that risk assessment mode. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the client's feeling very vulnerable. And I guess you're saying research is showing that they want that connection, they want empathy. And the practitioner perhaps is wanting to get to that suicide risk assessment to decide what to do. Mm -hmm. And that can also be a break in the process. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yep. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So, um, you, you started the answer to my question by saying, let's not talk about the hospital stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to just push back a little bit and yeah. say, you know, maybe just you piqued my curiosity by saying you did want to talk about something. And so maybe let's take that stance a little bit and tell me what is the argument, I guess, against, or well, the question was, isn't weak prediction better than nothing? Right. And so what do hospitals have, hospitalization have to do with that? So typically, a person's in high risk, we're particularly concerned about them, sort of that, that uh, intervention is hospitalization. So the data on hospitalization is not great. And so what's interesting about hospitalization is that not only is it on average not necessarily helpful, but there's also good evidence that in many cases, I'm not going to say all of the time, in many cases it's hurtful. So there's this interesting idea where they looked at uh, clients who were uh, hospitalized for suicide and afterwards, they assessed their um, PTSD symptoms related to hospitalization. So just related to the hospitalization. And this isn't, you know, a diagnosis or anything. So you can sort of think about it as, are they having some sort of a, you know, a traumatic reaction specific to the hospitalization? And over 40% of patients did. So I don't know if you've worked inpatient. I've worked a couple of inpatient. And I mean, it's not... If you've had that experience, it's not that hard to get to why that could be, which is oftentimes very dramatically. But if you're in, you know, a psychiatric unit, that there's a lot of variability in terms of who the patients are there, and so you know, you're on, you often are on the same unit as somebody who's, you know, experiencing psychosis. Um, um, and like that. There's, you know, there's also data where you have, again, it's so surprising, you know, staff who work on the unit who are not so nice to patients. Um, there were, you know, there, there's a big list of sort of uh, specific things that have been identified that lead to sort of these negative hospital experiences. So one of them is, um, feeling that if there was uh, violence in the unit, that staff wouldn't be able to resolve it. They wouldn't be able to deal with it. They, you know, they're not big enough, they're not willing, they're not whatever. So you think about patients uh, on the unit just experiencing fear, right? Sort of in their unit, just experiencing fear. Um, that, you know, other things that came up were um, that, you know, staff being more concerned about paperwork and things like that than actual care. Um, uh, that you know, think about all that you have to leave when you're on a unit, so or when you're when you're inpatient. 
So you have to stop your work if you're working. You have to stop your school if you're going to school. If you have any dependents, right? So for me, I have two kids. So if I were, you know, a part of taking care of that, sharing those, if I was all of a sudden inpatient for a week or two, all of those responsibilities go to my wife. I'm going to feel terrible about that. Um, all of, you know, if I stop getting paid or whatever, that's, you know, those, that's going to go away as well. So there are all these really, at the cost of being, you know, it depends, obviously for folks, it depends, there's a study in the US where, you know, it varies tremendously depending on insurance and state and all that sort of stuff. You know, getting inpatient can cost up to $1,000 a day. So all of these, you know, just obvious sort of negative aspects of going into the hospital. So those are aspects of the hospital. The, as a clinician, again, not to be too idealistic. So in the real world, there are a couple of, I think there are a couple of worthwhile things for you to think about if you do, if you are sort of in a tough spot and do feel like you're sort of, don't have any choice but to hospitalize somebody. So there's a literature on coercion. So how much patients feel like they've been coerced into going into the hospital? And so it's kind of, you know, so the idea being that, you know, the therapists weren't really coercing, you know, they didn't, it wasn't really what they wanted to do. They were sort of uh, manipulated into committing themselves in the hospital. And what's fascinating is even the people who um, voluntarily admit themselves, over 20% still perceive that they were coerced. So clinically, if you're, this is sort of the, in the real world, if you're sort of in a situation where you have to do this, it's and so, and that is strongly linked with sort of negative suicide related outcomes. So to work with your client such that they don't experience it as coercion, because if they do, their, you know, their outcomes just drop. So that's a really important thing to do when you work with clients. Great, great. And so I'm going back to the number you brought up earlier on, which is my one in 20,000. Yeah. And so I guess an extrapolation of what you're saying is, there's a lot of harm or, or inconveniences that we cause for the other 19,999. Mm -hmm. Correct? Correct. And I would say that even, well, I, I think there's also, it's difficult to say about that one, but um, there's, you know, this is a contentious thing. So I think, okay, so this is the other practical bit I would, of advice that I would give, which is a little, little bit, maybe not realistic. But so there's extreme between hospital variability in these sort of associations that they observe, not so surprisingly. Some hospitals are great, some hospitals not so much. Okay. So, and the great ones, I mean, great, I, I know that there are some great ones, but you know, the, um, if you live in a large, if you live in a metropolitan area and you have a choice in terms of which hospital to send folks to or to suggest that people go to, if possible, talk to patients, talk to former patients, talk to get your colleagues to talk to their clients, whatever, who have been hospitalized to learn about their experience. Mm -hmm. If you are stuck sort of hospitalizing someone, if you, there are, you know, if you have more than one hospital in your area, I think it's absolutely worth, I know it's complicated to do this, it's not scientific, but if you can, to do some due diligence, to talk to some folks. Um, I mean, you can always go, you know, talk to people who work there, um, but preferably to talk to people with the patients there and see what their experience is, to see what they can tell you and what you can learn. That way you can sort of say, all right, well, this hospital, you know, I have a couple of choices here. This one I've heard, you know, I've talked to several former patients and they've had not great things to say, and this one seems to be okay. So. Yeah, I don't actually consider that. When I in my practice, I just sort of assume they're all the same. What I'm hearing you say is there's quite a bit of a difference as to how clients may be treated or outcomes that happen. Exactly. Okay. Okay. And so what I'm gathering now is if I'm starting to do a suicide risk assessment with one of my clients, there's a lot of unintended, potentially unintended negative consequences. So some of them are in the moment because it may rupture the therapeutic alliance or just may temporarily, you know, disconnect the client from feeling you know, connected or bonded with the, as the therapist. Um, if I go ahead and deem the client to be high risk and you know, encourage them, coerce them, 
suggest to them, they go to the hospital, there's a lot of burden that comes with that for something that's a very low baseline behavior. Uh, are there any other unintended or negative consequences that could, that could come from results of a clinician taking risk assessment for suicide? Well, I mean, I think that <laughs> I mean, there's all sorts of other little nuance, but I think that's the real, you know, well, so I guess another interesting thing with this is, so when we look at how good we are at predis predicting suicide or, you know, yeah, predicting future suicidal behaviors. So even if we are really good, which we're not, we're awful, but even if we're really good at it, that actually, all that says is that we can identify. It doesn't say, can we help those people or what can we do with to help those people? So it's actually just like the first link in the chain. So that's the other, yeah, that gets to the hospitalization stuff where it seems like the hospitalization data suggests like, is it helpful? I mean, maybe in some places on average, probably not. You know, is it more hurtful than helpful in some places on average, maybe. Um, so just the prediction thing, that's just, you know, part of it. And then the, what you do about it, is that actually helpful? And it seems like, at least with hospitalization, it's sort of like, that doesn't seem like it. Yeah. So, yeah, and I think that that's, if you're stuck doing risk assessment, if you don't have a choice, then the important thing to keep in mind is I cannot predict risk or I cannot predict suicide. That is just a truth. I cannot do it. So if I do this, it's an exercise I'm doing, but take the pressure off of yourself to think that you're going to be able to do it to predict suicide because you will not be able to. You just can't. So just to know that. So this is one of the things in terms of thinking about I think about this a lot, which is there's the Pollyanna, like there's the idealistic, and then there's the realistic. And so the realistic, when you're stuck doing these things, okay, so what can I do? Can I hit on this for a minute? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so if I'm stuck, what can I do? So the first thing is take the pressure off of yourself. You cannot predict it, period. So just know that. So that they, okay, I can't predict it, but I'm stuck doing this. What should I do? So one thing that these are, other people have suggested these things. These aren't mostly aren't things that I've come up with. If you're particularly if you're at a center where there's a certain assessment you need to use, you probably do it. You know, well, it depends on your context. You, for many of us, we don't do it very often. Once or twice a year, once every other, whatever it happens to be, not very frequently. So then you're sort of, I know, you pull the thing out, you, you dust it off, and then you put it on your clipboard, and then you have to like read each one specifically to get that information because you haven't read it in forever. So one of the things that's worth doing is to practice with it every once in a while. So that way it becomes more um, sort of like inside. So you don't have to be as adherent to the actual form. So you can still fill it out, still collect the data, the information, but you're not stuck like reading this thing like because you haven't read it in six months, but you can still be with the client. So that's one. So then when you, so even if you're stuck doing that, knowing that you can't actually predict suicide risk and instead being with the client while you still have to fill it out. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And so I'm being particularly aligned with the client. So this still needs to be about the client. Mm -hmm. So there's that nice, I'll let you go next time. Yeah, I yeah. I mean, and I'm sort of thinking about this now, like I do with my insurance forms in a sense. And sometimes I'm like, okay, I got to ask these questions. You know, I got to get them today, some point today. This is why, this is the purpose of it. Uh, but it's more like I'm just doing them to get them done. That doesn't feel good either though. Right. And so I'm sort of thinking about this, applying that to suicide risk assessment. If the agency you work at or the organization you're with has a policy on this, like, should we still do it? In that sense, right? And for everyone, I would say no. I mean, what I would, you know, I, I, not everybody's, you know, an activist, but uh, you know, in a perfect world, you would, you know, I, the readings that I'm sending around, a lot of them are very clear that to um, present those to those on high mm -hmm. and to sort of to continue sort of to teach people about this. But if you are stuck doing it, I think you want to be able to. Do it so like that is not the priority. Like mm -hmm. I am with my client. Okay. I'm doing it because I have to do it. 
but in reality, it's not really the most therapeutic or the most helpful thing for the client. Exactly. Yeah. So how can I do it so it's therapeutic or helpful? So it's sort of like, um, you know, at one point I was working somewhere where I had to do a lot of uh, skit structural clinical interviews for the DSM. So just to collect, to get diagnosed for this big research study for this. And like, after I did a bunch of them, it just was like, I knew, I knew it. You know, I knew the thing, I knew the form. So I could have conversations with clients, they weren't clients, but I could have conversations with people and then just, you know, I could, I'd be able to fill out the form without actually, you know, and then at some point I would go, oh, let me just make sure I didn't miss it. But I was with the client and learning about their experience and their story and following up about, okay, so when you were, you said that you were sleeping, you, you know, you had trouble getting out of bed. So tell me more about that. So I was able to sort of approach it in this open-ended way to collect the information without being, you know, overly adherent to the form or even like worrying about it and then sort of taking notes. But I was able to, so, you know, clinically you can do the same thing where if you know the information to gather, you can be with the client having a, you know, a, a therapeutic conversation, get the information. And then at some point, okay, let me just make sure I didn't miss anything. But mm -hmm. you don't need to like, the, it's not like the form is in between you and the client. Right. It's still me and the client. Right. And I guess it makes a difference because if you realize or believe that the risk assessment is useless anyways, and so just get the information, but really it's just part of therapy then in that sense. That's, that, yeah, that's definitely how I would think about it. I think, so the one thing, can I, the, I don't want to lose track of this, but I think that there is, there, there is a little bit of baby in the bathwater, um, which in terms of like the things that we do that, that do seem to be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things in particular is means restriction counseling. Okay, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, so like, you know, means restriction. So this is, you know, the idea of you take away whatever the okay. potential suicidal means is. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times, you know, means restriction broadly, we often think about it very like public health kind of way. So this is, you know, there's all sorts of cool stuff that's done, but like, this is where like there are bridge nets on like bridges where people will have sort of frequently um, jumped for, you know, um, in the suicide attempt. So, you know, you put these nets in the bridge so a person can't jump. Um, they're very effective. And there's, you know, data to suggest that those same people don't go and attempt in another place or another way. So it actually does produce actual overall suicide. So, um, but you do that at the individual level, which is, you know, means restriction counseling. So there's a couple of ways, a couple of ways to think about it. So one is with just with the client, and then one is like with close others or family. So with the family stuff, which is, I think there's a bunch of work on this. It's super cool, particularly with parents with youth who are suicidal. Mm -hmm. And so it, you, you know, therapist, whatever, sit down with family, parents, the youth, whatever, talk about this, talk about means restriction. And so the data are strong across different types of means. So this work, a lot of the research has been done in the area of firearms for obvious reasons. Um, but there's also been work in other areas as well, um, you know, including uh, medication, pill overdose, that sort of thing. Um, and just by having these, by doing this means restriction counseling, it, for parents with youth who are suicidal, it increases their risk or is shown to increase their, I'm sorry, not risk, their, their, the probability of them restricting the means like over 50%. Right? So that like, so this is not an intuitive thing. So most parents who have suicidal kids don't intuitively think I should do this with the firearm or with the drugs or whatever it happens to be. But when they learn about it, just that learning about it and that means restriction counseling does seem to be really effective in terms of getting them to restrict means. So there's this really great paper um, Craig Bryan, I think it was 2011 or 2012, wrote this really nice paper that really, where he talks about, or they talk about, several authors, how to do this clinically. So it's a really nice sort of clinical guide for how to do this with clients, because what they were saying was that that was where they were seeing that clinicians were hesitant because it's like, all right, they can learn, like they don't have many difficulties working with clients to identify primary means. But then how to move into the actual means restriction, that's where they're having trouble. So they wrote this paper sort of outlining, sort of well, more than outlining, really going through the nuance of how one could do this. And so obviously the first thing is identifying what the means are, 
And there's good data to suggest that most folks, they don't change. So if you're gonna say firearm, and usually it's, you know, my firearm, my gun, whatever, that they're not gonna to switch to something else if the firearm is no longer available. Like that's the means. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, what they, they really emphasize is, so again, the client is suicidal, not because they wanna die, but because they want the pain to stop. Mm -hmm. So it's the therapist's job to get with the client in the collaborative project of reducing the pain. Right? The collaborative project is not keeping them from dying. The collaborative project is, the primary collaborative project is reducing the pain. And then within that collaboration, you develop a relationship, you develop trust. And you frame means restriction as we need to, we need to get rid of this, this, this threat, this external thing that is, is a danger to you so that we can keep working on helping you to reduce the pain. And so within that relationship, within that collaboration, focusing on helping the client, that's where you can, you discuss the means restriction. Yeah. By where it is, okay. And then when you do means restriction, it, again, they, this goes back to sort of the coercion thing and goes to hospitalization. You don't coerce the, product, the client or sort of force the client to get rid of their firearm or drugs or whatever it happens to be, you work with the client. So they gave the example of firearms and where you know a lot of people um, are gonna be very hesitant to give up their firearm. So work within that. So this could be things like, what would you think about if we locked up bullets? Or if you told a component of the firearm that's necessary for it to function and lock that up or remove that. Then also create explicit conditions, and they sort of talk about, they have this whole uh, means, they, have this, they call it a receipt, but when you write this, this down, give it to the client, you know, each have a copy, um, but then, you know, when will we take it away, or when will we move it away from you, and then when will we give it back? You know, so the idea isn't just, we're going to take your firearm and never get it, give it back, it's, you know, in this particular context, when you're sort of really, you know, suicide, suicidal thinking is particularly high, whatever it is, we're going to remove it. Um, and then when that, we'll, we'll give it back. So that way it's like, there is, there is clarity. So it's not just, we're not just taking this thing away from you and you can't have it anymore. It's much more collaborative. Okay. Okay. So whereas we're, we're awfully terrible at predicting risk. And when we make a risk assessment for clients for our suicide, we're way more likely to be wrong than right. But Fortunately, though, it sounds like you're saying there are good evidence-based evidence-based ways of dealing with the suicide, the suicidality, evidence-based ways of reducing the pain, reducing the risk, and that we are good at in a sense. But that there is evidence for how to intervene in that way. Yes, uh, yeah, I, I don't know I, when does it become good, but yeah, I mean, I think there are things that we can do that are, have been there's evidence are effective. Okay. So then now. Don't we need to do a risk assessment to know how to intervene? Like, shouldn't, would we tailor our interventions based on the risk? And so in that way, wouldn't we need a risk assessment? What do you mean? So if your client's high risk or you deem your client high risk, wouldn't that affect how you intervened versus if your client was deemed low risk? Or does it not matter at all? Because I'm thinking if you take out a suicide risk assessment, if I pick any client issue, I sort of assess the severity level and it influences the type of counseling that I do, the interventions that I use, what I focus on in session. So what about in this case here? Yeah, it's a good question. So one way to think about it is like, person's suicidal, person's not suicidal. The majority of your clients aren't suicidal, right? They, they're not even like low, they're just like, they're just not. So there's that category of people. But then for, if somebody is somewhat suicidal, then all of the, at least the one the, the intervention, well, I guess I want to talk about means, resp means restriction, helping reduce pain, I and mean, that's sort of what we do in some ways with all of our clients. Mm -hmm. um, those are things that we, you know, even if a person was just sort of mildly suicidal, that we could, that we should probably be doing. So, yeah, so this is an interesting argument too, which is that some of the, uh, uh, 
large and some of those folks have talked about, which is that because we're so bad at risk prediction, that it, it sort of becomes meaningless. So like we can't have these sort of extreme interventions just for those people because we have no idea. Like they're, they're still so improbable, it's so improbable they're gonna attempt suicide. Mm -hmm. So what we need to think about are sort of smaller interventions that can be applied across suicide risk, sort of lower cost. And I'm not talking about just financially, but broadly speaking interventions that can be applied across suicide risk categorizations. Um, so safety plans are something that have been, become very popular. There's some evidence that they're effective. Um, so, but they're, have you done safety plans? Yes. Yeah, but it's like they thought it was best practices. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, it's considered. Uh, yeah, and so, but how long does it take you to do a safety plan on average? Well, depending on the situation. Sure. So anywhere from like five minutes to like 20 minutes. Sure, but still, five minutes to 20 minutes, low cost. So even if it's a person's at a, you know, pretty low risk of suicide, five to 20 minutes, Okay. Reasonable investment. So. Reasonable investment. So, yeah, that's sort of the idea. So it's you know, so does the person need to be at high risk for you to spend those five to twenty minutes? Let's say it's an average of ten. Probably not. I mean, moderate, even lowish risk is worth doing. Okay, great. I have two more questions, and we're going to turn over to the audience for questions. Um, so, um, two more questions left. One of my questions is, I, I, mean, I have my personal answers. I'm kind of curious to hear your answers, um, and. This really came to when we had the uh, speaker talk last year on trigger warnings yeah. and how uh, normative practices were so disparate from evidence. And even when presented with study after study, people just refused to believe it and refused to change their practices. And yeah. so, I mean, I'm still like shaking about that because I just assumed trigger warnings were great and wonderful, had all the evidence behind them. Sure. So if I apply that here, given from what you're seeing, the evidence base is so strong that we're terrible at risk assessment for suicide, that it seems to hurt the uh, counseling and therapy process, but yet why do we keep doing them? And why can't I turn off that voice in my head that does a risk assessment naturally when I have a client in front of me? Right. So I think it's a, you know, why? And I think the, the answers are, well, one, we just don't know any better. So I mean, the fact that it's, which is just like not in the water. And I think that's one of the reasons it's important to have these conversations because I think that really thoughtful, caring, intelligent people, you know, th this can't be everybody's areas of, area of research. Like it's mm -hmm. ridiculous. Not everybody is going to go into the literature for everything. So even, you know, academics, it's ridiculous. So we're reliant on other people, experts, but other people who to like teach us these things. So, but, so I think that, you know, it's unrealistic to expect everybody to go and actually really investigate everything that's silly. Um, and so because of that, oftentimes it just gets sort of, you know, there, there isn't anything to sort of disrupt those beliefs. And then, you know, we get trained, we go through university in our training. And again, we don't go and investigate every single thing before we teach it or train it. So some of the stuff we just do because that's what we were trained to do. So I think that that is just not, that, that hasn't, there isn't enough disruption. There hasn't been enough disruption. So that's where I think there's value in disruption of that. Mm. And then consistent with that, organizational policies, as well as um, you know, legal policies, precedents, whatever, where there are certain expectations of certain things. Um, so yeah, I think that all that happens in most vast majority of clinicians who have learned those things, they're gonna do what they think are best practices and do the best they can. Uh, and there's all sorts of pressures on them. And what else do I do? And I mean, fear, I think fear plays a big, a big role in it. But actually, there's one thing, let me, um, there's something I grabbed because there are, so I, I just think this is really compelling. So this was, so the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, uh, which is nice, their guidelines on self-harm assessment management prevention, preventing reoccurrence, 2022. So, so this is this, you know, this British or English uh, group of uh, experts who got together to have to develop these recommendations. And so here are some of the recommendations. So this is recommendation 1.6.1. 1. 
do not use risk assessment tools and scales to predict future suicide repetition or self-harm. Recommendation 1.6.2, do not use risk assessment tools and scales to determine who should and should not be offered treatment, who should or who should be discharged. Recommendation 1.6.3, do not use global risk stratification into low, medium, or high risk to predict future suicide or repetition of self-harm. 1.6.4, do not use global risk stratification in low, medium, or high to determine who should be offered treatment or who should be discharged. So this is something where this is, you know, the English are big on sort of their national medical stuff. And so, you know, they're putting, you know, they get a group of experts together and they are very explicitly saying this. So it is important that we use this, these sort of guidelines to, because if you look, you know, at CAMH or all these other places, their guidelines don't say anything like this. Mm -hmm. So it's important for us to confuse this uh, and sort of make these arguments. And this is another thing. So in doing this work, at some point, I sort of said like, okay, I'm going to specifically go in to try to find evidence to the contrary, because maybe I'm just getting sort of a microcosm of people who, and so I eventually stumbled across this uh, paper. So the paper, Wurzel 2017, why suicide risk assessment still matters. Great, an argument against risk, or an argument for risk assessment. I get to hear a counter argument for this, right? Mm -hmm. so, all right, great. So this is uh, a quote from the paper. So why risk and suicide risk assessment still matters. This is a quote. Suicide risk assessment, especially when limited to structured instrument, performed in isolation or in place of gainful therapeutic activity makes little sense. This is from why it matters. Mm -hmm. Makes little sense. When risk assessment occurs independent of more comprehensive mental health evaluation and treatment, it provides virtually no clinical benefit and may provide false assurances. So it's thinking that your client's low risk, even though that not being that meaningful. So they, their argument, which I see this argument, which I don't really buy, is you should do risk assessment for the, pers for the um, purpose of conceptualization. And I think, well, it's fine to do assessment for the purpose of case conceptualization and treatment planning. I should do risk assessment. You do risk assessment to predict risk. Right. Not for case conceptualization with treatment. Then you just do assessment. assessment. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now I'm feeling really terribly about our, our students here or any of our sister program who are listening into this because we just put them through our sort of standard external agency suicide assessment and intervention workshop. Sounds like the intervention stuff is probably quite useful for them to hear. Um, but now the question is, is how should we be training our students now? So what should we take back to our area? In terms of next year, do we need to look at that workshop that we just offer as a standard? Um, but what should we do? How should we train our students? Yeah, so you know, it's this interesting thing. In a perfect world, we would train them in a way that has nothing to do with risk assessment or suicide prediction in a perfect world. In the real world, we might train them and put it and put the asterisk, you might have to do this. So we're going to teach you how to do it. So that way when you go to a set center on internship, you go wherever you are equipped with the ability to fill out this form and do this thing, but know that it is useless. <laughs> so I think that either one of those two options, probably the latter, being teaching them how to work within the system is probably the uh, most useful for them. And then it is to teach, you know, um, safety planning, uh, means restriction counseling, and there are other things that can be helpful. Um, in terms of working with suicidal clients. But I think, and then it is also to really instill in them, well, one, not to be afraid of it, um, and to work with clients who are suicidal. That them being suicidal, if you're working with a client, them experiencing suicidality, like that should be brought into the case of conceptualization. And it is important to talk about that because that is part of their experience. However, they're not distressed because they're suicidal. You might be. But they are not typically. They are suicidal because they are distressed. So it is typically your agenda to focus on the suicide, not theirs. So to well, the suicidality needs to be placed in context to get just like all of your other clients. 
What is it that matters to them? Are they there? What's causing the pain for them? How can I use my skills, my yeah, my abilities to help them, whatever that is? Okay. And you may not have an answer to this, Sarah, though, but I'm just reflecting on the second option you gave, which was train the students in it, tell them this is not really worth very much, it's not going to help very much, and then let them go off and do it if they have to do it. But they're already being complicit in continuing the legacy of non-evidence-based practices and perhaps practices that actually can cause harm or at least just waste valuable time. Right, yeah. I think in some ways it's sort of, you know, a lot of people, there's a lot of, um, everybody has a, an opinion about the DSM. And I think that, you know, a lot of folks feel like ah, the DSM is not really the best way to sort of organize or sort of frame or think about your work with your clients, what the problems are and how to move forward with them. But, you know, it's part of the field. You need to learn how to do it. You need to be able to help you communicate with people. You need to put it in your notes. So you still do it. Um, you know, in a way, I sort of feel a little yucky even suggesting this, but I think that there is sort of, there, there perhaps is something to that. I mean, I, I am somewhat hopeful that just continuing, not me, but just lots of, you know, continue to have these conversations. And again, these sort of professional or sort of uh, federal guidelines that sort of explicitly say, do not do this. It is not helpful. Um, I think those are steps in the right direction. So I guess one of our jobs is to start, you know, in Canada is to start trying to influence Canadian thinking, Canadian policy. Mm -hmm. Let's see Canadian framing around these things. Okay, well, hopefully uh, this speaker series and your talk today contributes to that and getting the word out because I was so shocked when I heard you speak. Um, okay, so let's turn over to some questions. Um, for the members of the audience, um, if you look at your Zoom at the bottom, there's a Q&A button. And if you click the Q&A button, you have the opportunity to post some questions to us. So I'd encourage people now to take a moment if you have any uh, questions or comments or reflections, uh, please feel free to post those now. So, Dr. Betty, we do have some questions already. Um, would you like me to read them off? Oh, I got them here. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, all right. The first question just someone says, this makes me feel so much better as I am starting my private practice. So, <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of relief. Is it okay? I don't have to worry about predicting my client's suicide risk because I can't do it accurately anyways. Yeah. So that's one way of framing it. Yeah. Um, so the next question is, uh, what you're presenting totally makes sense to me. However, how could this be represented in court or a coroner's inquest? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think that is going to be an extremely nuanced question in terms of um, where you live, what those particular sort of what, I don't know, Rob, actually you would have a better sense of this problem than I would. You know more about ethics codes and you know, uh, what are your thoughts about it? Yeah, well, uh, fortunately, though, I haven't had, I've written many reports for the courts that I've actually got to testify until probably two weeks from now. So um, I'll see. Um, in my experience there, though, I think it's quite dogmatic. And there's a problem in the sense that the rules are decided by people who are not psychologists. And they're quite influenced by easy answers. And so I don't really have a great answer to that. Um, other than I try to educate. But a lot of the rules of court are decided by people who Write a paper on CBT, you know, and the lawyer says, well, you don't take CBT, you're being unethical. And right. see, I got one study here in that sense. And so it is a tough question to answer. And I think I would go back to the point in which we have to start making this known. Um, I remember I gave a talk uh, a, while, a long time ago to the Trial Lawyer Association, just about, it's not about the intervention only, the relationship actually matters. And so when the therapist puts it in the notes, it's actually good practice in that sense. That was educational because they were so focused in on the interventions in that way. Mm -hmm. So I think would add to that? Or? No, I mean, I think that, um, and this is partially also where it comes to like working within the system is to figure out how can I work within the system while still being um, an effective clinician for my client. So if you do have to collect the risk assessment data and put it into your notes and sort of frame that or whatever, anything, you know, that you, you can do that while not losing your ability to be a good therapist. And similarly, if you're stuck uh, um, sort of having one of your patients be hospitalized, that again, that if you can, if you intend to getting on the same page with your client, not coercing them, getting them into the best 
hospital that you're aware of and facilitating all of this do sort of the reducing the non-therapeutic stuff or the non-helpful things, then you're still working within the system. You know, you'd still be fine in court, but you're also attending to what's best for the client. Mm -hmm. Or at least within the context in which you're kind of stuck. Yeah, it actually connects to one of the questions here. So I'll just read the question out, uh, but there may not be an additional answer. Um, just as Kavi Gandhi says, that was a very valuable talk. I agree, and my own experience reflects this. However, I am scared of the legal side of this, of not doing it. Yeah, so I think figure out what it is that you need to do to sort of check the boxes and figure out how to work within that. And I think part of it is knowing I cannot predict this. So just even just knowing that, so taking the pressure off and thinking, all right, I need to figure out how to sort of work within the system so that I don't get in trouble. Um, legally or with the college or whatever it happens to be, but I can still be most helpful, you know, as helpful as I can be with my client. Okay, great. Uh, next question here. Isolating someone who feels, who is feeling helpless and hopeless and suicidal just compounds on the issue. Unfortunately, many organizations will have this as a recourse to do uh, rather than the well-being of the client. The reality is that having the expectation that we will stop everyone from committing suicide is totally unrealistic. I just want to say with the hospitalization stuff, as I was sort of thinking about it, I don't know. I'm sort of, I guess I feel like I'm sort of saying things like it's like simple. And it's not. Like, I, it's, this is extremely gray. And I think that, I mean, it's hard. I mean, it's hard when you're sort of fighting against, um, you know, you have to worry about, you know, being sued or worry about losing your registration. Um, but if you, you know, so I think if there is a your particular organization, some of them are going to have certain expectations while others will have different expectations. So I think sort of if you can sort of internalize this idea of like, I can't predict this and I need to be thinking about how I can help my client most while simultaneously, you know, not getting myself in trouble. And there's a lot of nuance there. Um, yeah, it's not an easy thing. Uh, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, next question. Do you use the same approach when dealing with clients who have access to guns, especially if talking about homicidal suicide allegations? Well, the means restriction, I'm assuming. I guess so. Yeah, so that would be, and that's sort of where the means restriction counseling is the biggest, you know, is a lot of it is around firearm ownership. Um, there's a statistic that um, firearm owners uh, are twice as likely to die by suicide than not, or I'm sorry, not firearm owners. People who have a fire, firearm in the home are um, more than twice as likely to die by suicide than those who don't. An interesting thing, too, in the military, um, that most uh, folks in the military who die by suicide using a firearm, um, it's a private firearm. It's not a firearm that they have for work. I think that so it's sort of this, it is this, it's a, I thought that was, because I didn't expect that. Um, so, sort of, you know, at the end of the day, typically, uh, in the military, you sort of put your whatever firearm you were using that day goes somewhere. You know, you put it, you lock it up at work. So that's not that's uh, typically not the firearm that's used to die by suicide or to attempt suicide. It's interesting. Interesting. Okay. Uh, next question here: Of the people at high risk of suicide, who one out of twenty thousand suicide in the following day, compared to one out of forty thousand low risk. Do we know whether the interventions to stop the high-risk people from acting contributes that low number? Does that make sense? I'll read the question over again. Of the people at high risk of suicide who won 20,000 suicide the following day, compared to one out of 40,000 low risk, do we know whether the interventions to stop the high-risk people from acting contributes that lower number? Or is it a lower number? It's a higher number. So um, let's see if I can turn this question here, though. I think what it might be getting at is you said there were a higher, there was a lower risk of people who are high risk of suicide from actually committing suicide, lower probability. Correct. Oh, yeah. Of the people, so of those 125,000 people, mm -hmm. I don't know that I don't remember the exact number, but some number of them died by suicide. Mm -hmm. Of those people who died by suicide, only about 10% were in the high risk group. Right. So if you're in the high risk group, there's still a higher probability 
of you dying by suicide than a person in a low risk group because it's one in 20,000 instead of one in 45,000. So what that, so there's still a higher probability if you're in the high risk group. What it's saying is of all the suicides, the majority of them are not in the high risk group. And I think this person is also getting at that perhaps intervention for the high risk people contributed to the lower risk or to the lower outcomes because you wouldn't intervene the same way had you deemed the client low risk. Yeah, and so that this person, yes, yeah, so the that particular study doesn't look at um, didn't look at interventions per se. So they were all psychiatric patients, and so um, yeah, yeah. But I mean, there is work. I mean, there are interventions that there is evidence for effectiveness. As I mean, just restricted counseling being one of them. Okay, great. Oh, I'm really interested to answer this question here. So, how can I justify to myself and others not sending a in quotation marks high risk person to the hospital? Oh, well, okay. So if you're talking about like an actual, like, uh, moral, like, how can I live with myself? Like, well, there's a couple of reasons. There, there are a couple of ways. One is because you have no, you're, you have no ability to actually predict um, if they're going to uh, attempt suicide. And um, they almost certainly are not. That doesn't, not to do things about it. I'm just, that was just what the data say. Um, and because hospital, there's at least some evidence, tends to be more hurtful than helpful. So that's how I would justify it to yourself, but then justify, again, this gets back to the issue, which is an extremely good one. I mean, if anybody who's listening out there in Zoomland, um, if you know anybody who, uh, either a lawyer or somebody who'd be sort of thoughtful about this, I would love to have a conversation with them, whether it's specific to British Columbia or more broadly in terms of sort of thinking, thinking this through um, and sort of how to sort of, serve both masters, if you will, just shoot me an email. So I'd love to chat with somebody who actually had expertise in these things. Great. Okay. Well, next question I can answer. It goes, excellent presentation is so helpful. My sense is that we will grab onto these rituals like a suicide checklist as a way of reducing therapist anxiety uh, related to sitting with someone's emotional pain. I completely agree with focusing on being a caring, thoughtful clinician. Could you share the presentation articles you cited? Thank you. So yes. Um, after the talk, within a week, we will have the reading sent out. So there will be a reading list that substantiates some of these points that Dr. Cox is making. Yeah, and it's, um, and a lot of them, you know, because there's so much evidence for this, a lot of them are systematic reviews, meta-analyses. It's this lovely uh, review paper that was just published in Clinical Psych Review, I think it was in 2022. Um, that it just, you know, it's, it's sort of, so much of it is already sort of put together that you don't have to go hunting too far. Um, the next person wants to test their understanding out. I am hearing the value of risk assessment if it is part of genuine and caring treatment and avoid moving to a rigid tick box assessment. From what I hear you're saying is there isn't value for risk assessment at all or very minimal value. With the, yeah, so I, I'm making the, sorry, was there more to the question? That was it. Yeah. So I'm making the statement that, so if I say risk assessment, I am assessing risk. Why would I do that? I can't think of any other reason to do that than to think I'm assessing risk in order to say, what's the probability of this thing happening? And then so that I can do something about it. Is there any sort of logical other reason why you do risk assessment? Mm -hmm. Right. So since we can't predict in any clinically useful way what will happen, why would we assess risk that implies the aim of prediction like we can do assessment and case conceptualization and all that stuff and that's great like i'm all for that um obviously and why wouldn't we be but if we call it risk assessment to me that implies i, I don't see it I, i'd love to hear it <laughs> that implies i'm assessing risk to make some sort of decision about it mm -hmm. right okay well leave me to the next question here dr cox i remember my supervisor's comment during my residency that you cannot stop somebody from taking their life if they intend to take their life. So in principle, I agree, but is there an estimate about false positive better than a false negative in this situation? Probably saving a life. So that's the frame for the question is, isn't it better to have a false positive so that way we can see, potentially save that one in 20,000 person's life than having a false negative and missing it? Sure. So 
I think that that because hospitalization does not seem to be particularly helpful and might even be harmful, then how would we save it? So, you know, this gets back to sort of what Rob's question or what Rob's point was earlier. So the interventions that we have, you know, we do have interventions and treatments and approaches that do seem to be useful for helping clients who are suicidal. And I do agree that if a person, if a person's suicidal, it's good to have an understanding of those, you know, do a safety plan, um, do counseling for means restriction. There's other approaches out there. <clears throat> there's apps, there's other things that have some evidence for effectiveness that you should absolutely click into doing those things. So I'm totally on board with that. It's where it falls down is our, the typical thing, which is a person's high risk, so we send them to the hospital. So in a way, yes, I agree with you. If you have that error of, if you have the type one error, the false positive, then you should do something to help that person because it could save their life. What you shouldn't do is something that has a big cost, cost being not just financial, cost in lots of different ways for that client, which doesn't actually help to save their life, which would be hospitalization. Okay, just time for a few more questions. I apologize in advance that we're not going to be able to get to all the questions. I do appreciate the other people seeing so many questions. Um, next comment. It sounds like your primary concerns with the rigid structured risk assessment and scale. Am I correct that you're still advocating lots of conversation and questioning about suicidal thoughts and intent when you sense that a client is seriously depressed? It seems that you need to gather lots of information to put a restriction plan in place. Yes, yeah, yeah, there's, there's zero problem with substantial conversation. I think with a couple of things in mind. Coming out of that conversation, you will not be able to effectively predict their risk. So that is gone, you cannot do it, you, you cannot do that. And also that they are suicidal because they are in pain. They're not in pain because they're suicidal. The suicide is extremely important to you. The pain is much more important to them. So it's totally appropriate and be very clinically valuable to talk about, discuss, collect information, conceptualize the suicidality within that broader framework. And that if you want to be on the same page as the client, it's going to be more about helping them move through the pain than stopping them from dying by suicide. Okay, great. Uh, the last question, I'm very excited to ask this question here because I'm curious. Whenever you say that, I get nervous. <laughs> well, it's a, just a question we haven't really covered, but what is the history of how we ended up doing suicide risk assessments so ubiquitously in this way? How did we get here? That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that question. That's something that I've asked as well, and I just haven't gone down that rabbit hole, so I'm sure it will be a rabbit hole. But that's a really, really good question because I have no idea. Sorry, it would be disappointing on the last question. That really has to be the last question. Uh, that's, uh, it's, I think it's a good answer because I think it applies to a lot of things. You know, look at trigger warnings as a one example. I look at some of the talks from last year, and I was really disillusioned about my belief of the evidence base and my convincing of how convinced I was that the evidence base was there for some things that aren't. Um, and so I think it's probably a good topic for some social psychologists to investigate. Well, we tend to follow these trends that we still believe that are really backed up by evidence in, in the broadest sense. Yeah, totally. Okay. Um, with that said, then, I think this is going to bring to a close our first speaker of uh, this year. Uh, thank you so much to our attendees. Again, I apologize for not getting to all the questions and comments that were written out. Um, within a week, we will have a list of readings out to everybody who consented to have a reading list sent out to them as well as a copy of the slides introducing the purpose of the speaker series. After hearing you speak today, uh, Dr. Cox, or having a conversation, I do think as speakers, it's very important to help get the word out about things that we just take for granted and assume. And it definitely feels like suicide risk assessment, something that we just follow and do and think that there's a big evidence base that there actually isn't. So I appreciate you coming aboard today. I appreciate you talking to me. I appreciate you sharing your wisdom and knowledge uh, with your audience. So thank you so much for Thanks All for right. having me. Great. Thank you, everyone. Great.
everybody. I want to get express my appreciation. I hope everybody has a wonderful day or evening, depending on uh, which time zone you're in, because I looked at the attendees and it looks like we have an international audience from as far away as India. So great, everybody. Have a wonderful day.